everyone to our final forum presentation of the semester. We've got a noted expert with us who's going to share his <laughs> insights and his publication, Dr. Daryl Newton. Thank, you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. First of all, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, as I was explaining to some of you a few moments ago, I hope to do is not bore you for the next half hour or so talking about my research, but as you know, academics, even administrative ones, love to talk about their work, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm talking about the first book that I published back in 2011 in the UK, 2012 then in North America, that looks at issues surrounding the BBC, quite frankly, but more importantly, it looks at how the BBC changed its cultural practices and also changed its policies and procedures once West Indians began immigrating into England after the Second World War. Now previously, of course, the BBC since 1938 has been like this, we're talking about television now, has been this sort of like harbinger of everything good and proper and everything that's culturally acceptable and this great acculturator of all sorts of different, oh my goodness, dare I say different ethnicities because the BBC was, of course, all around the world. Uh, the ongoing expression, I think you may have heard, is the sun never sets on the British Empire. And saying that to say that every single place you can think about around the country, around the world, I should say, there were indeed British colonies. Well, the upside of that is this, if there is an upside to colonization. Every place there was indeed a BBC colony, there was a BBC radio outlet. So if indeed, let's say, something took place in West Africa, the BBC was there. Something happened in Canada, the BBC was there. Australia, they were there. Very few second-hand pieces of information were passed over the BBC because they often had people on the ground, which was a good thing. And despite the fact they considered themselves to be this great acculturator, they never thought they'd have to engage with something like race. And then along came West Indian immigration after World War II. Originally, they thought, well, gee, let's welcome these people in. It's great to have them here. We're so pleased they're coming in to help Mother England, as they did in the war. But shortly after that, issues came up regarding labor problems and racial problems and housing issues and things like this. And once those things began, then suddenly the BBC had to slam on brakes and say, wait a second, gee, we better create some programming to address this issue. So you started out trying to do scientific programming, which they brought in a bunch of uh, really intelligent scientific types from various universities around the UK to talk about the notion of racial differences, how there really weren't any. And they went back and looked at cranial capacities and all sorts of other eugenic issues and things like that. However, the British population and the television public said, wait a second, we don't care about scientific principles. Tell us how we're going to deal with riots taking place down the street from us because a bunch of teddy boys, those were indeed working class white British youth, how we deal with riots, those guys are starting because a black West Indian family moved in up the street. Tell me how to deal with issues on the job in which black West Indians are being beaten down by white coworkers of mine because they happen to want the jobs that they currently hold. Tell me how we're going to make this all work out now the West Indians are coming in four and five thousand every few months. So suddenly BBC had to again put on brakes and say, wait a second, let's back up and rethink all this. So they created programming to address these issues, radio shows, TV shows, written documentation, and all of that. But despite the seemingly liberal approach to immigration, there was indeed a very strong, strong subset, shall we say, of people within the BBC and also within the British government and within the colonial office that said, wait a second, you know what? Maybe we should start thinking about some of these people going back home. So along came different sorts of issues regarding, oh, the Commonwealth Act of 1962, which essentially said, if you are indeed a member of the Commonwealth, you can travel around any British colony you like. However, as of 1962, unless you have someone that was born in this country, you can't stay here. So all of a sudden, a lot of people had to leave and go back to their home countries. And this created a real riff, as you can imagine, in many, many circles. Okay, well... It was about 1958 or so that the BBC published a little booklet called Going to Britain, question mark, that was meant to be passed out to black West Indians in England or in the colonies thinking about coming to England to say, wait a second, 
If you're coming to England, you better think about some of these issues we're going to share with you. And the overall publication, you guys, was very, very dystopic, very negative. It wasn't quite so much like, hey, come to England. You're welcome here. We want you on our street. We want you as a co-worker. Here's what you should do to have success in England. It's much more about, oh, it's going to be cold. It's going to be miserable. There's going to be racism. Be ready for it. If someone makes a joke about you, you should just laugh it off as West Indians are accustomed to doing in situations like that and these kinds of things. And, of course, many West Indians who read this had real issues with it because they felt as though it was indeed discouraging them from coming to the country and to the British Isles, which, in fact, it was. So it creates this kind of, dare I say, counterproductive effort on the part of the BBC, whereas they were indeed trying to acculturate everyone into thinking that, hey, we're all more equal than not. At the same time, they were saying, but you black West Indians think twice before coming to this country. Here are the kinds of things you should worry about. Okay? That's the precursor. Now, what I want to do is breeze through this. What I'll be doing basically is doing what my UK colleagues have twisted my arm to do over the years, having given 27 papers between here and there in the Middle East and all sorts of other places, is simply reading through the paper and paraphrasing along the way. Okay? Any questions, of course, I'll, have, I'll address those for you at the end, and feel free to stop me along the way if you'd like to. All right. Within this paper, I critically examine a manual published by the BBC in 1958, especially for West Indian settlers with support from the colonial office. The Going to Britain booklet addresses the proper manner to adapt to living in England for these settlers, including acceptance of racism, unemployment, and squalid living conditions. These attempts to educate West Indians on how to fit into British society were released during a period in which news programming framed racial problems as a direct result of immigration, including the infamous uprisings at Notting Hill and Nottingham. Going to Britain was also released within four years of the Commonwealth Act of 1962, limiting immigration from what was considered the colonies. I address the cultural representations and power in media from a grounded theoretical perspective that draws from ethnographic analyses and qualitative research. I also acknowledge the work of Fanon, Said, Fisk, and original documents from the Kew Archives and from the BBC Written Archives Centre at Reading, England. Portions of this research appear in Paving the Empire Road, BBC Television, and Black Britons. That's the first book I told you guys about. As a precursor to the pamphlet, there already had been broadcasts on the World Service targeting West Indian listeners. The Call in the Caribbean program from 1943 to 1961 began before the war and targeted the British territories of the region. The broadcast featured famed West Indian authors George Lemming and Samuel Selvin, who each served as hosts for the BBC's West Indian Colonial Service. Due to their popularity and cultural capital, the BBC recruited each writer to develop portions of Going to Britain, addressing issues, issues such as rules of the house when renting, employment problems, and potentially racist workmates. They provide advice to these hopeful citizens while serving as Fanon-like compradors negotiating cultural differences. If I may for a second, you guys are familiar with Fanon, I think, most of you probably. If not, he basically was um, a West Indian writer. No, I'm sorry, he was from West Africa. And Franz Fanon addressed uh, colonialism and its dangers uh, in many, many ways, of course. He talked about notions of the comprador, the comprador being a kind of cultural middleman or middlewoman who helps one culture understand another culture and kind of moves back and forth between the two places. Well, I argue, of course, in the book and also in this work that both Lemming and Selvin served as compradors. They were hired by the BBC because they were respected by West Indian audiences to talk about the kinds of issues they may um, run into. And of course, at the same time, they were in many ways, making the message much more palatable for West Indians. The hegemonic yet intertextual efforts of the BBC through radio, television, and later print thereby influenced the self-definition of those hailed by BBC-funded publications, encouraging corrective behavior, and Foucauldian self-policing. Now, again, if I can depart for a second, when I talk about Foucauldian self-policing, I'm talking about, of course, Michel Foucault. Anybody? I see some heads nodding. Good. And Foucault, of course, with self-policing, he talks about this whole idea of essentially how power plays out in the body. So, for example, 
With self-policing, Foucault argues through this whole notion of panopticism that we sometimes don't have to even be policed by authority. We can self-police. For example, can you imagine like times you may walk into a store and you look around, you don't really care for anything, and as you're leaving, you're walking through the detector that catches shoplifters. What happens as you walk through? Anyone, what do you feel at that moment? Any paranoia? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, you stop and think, gee, I don't have anything in my pockets, do I? We know fully well you don't. But at that very moment, you stop to think and rethink and rethink. Is there something in my pocket that might stop these alarms? That's self-policing. And by reading the Going to Britain booklet, West Indians are then expected to self-police. I have to behave the proper way to be in England, or I can't say the wrong things, or I can't argue with my workmates. Again, kind of helping the government and helping hegemonic power maintain a sense of place for these people. Within the development of the BBC, a public service agenda became an essential part of its programming. The corporation's efforts to mold the social consciousness of a nation moved far beyond the shores of Mother England to, in the case of the study, the British Isles via short wave. Besides special programs that called upon the assistance of Jamaicans to serve Her Majesty's Armed Forces during World War II, other shows offered light affair, including literary readings by prominent Caribbean writers. As an example, on the 11th of March, 1943, the BBC began the Caribbean Voices radio program with producers Una Marson and Kenneth Black. After the war, the West Indians began, sorry, after the war, as West Indians began to increase efforts to immigrate to England, BBC management was encouraged to address these settlers. Subsequently, talks programs offered on the Colonial Services radio broadcasts addressed life in England for potential immigrants. However, it was 21 June 1948 when BBC Pathé film cameras covered an event at Tilbury Docks in Essex, Essex, England, changing the face of Britishness forever. The ship Empire Windrush arrived with a group of 492 West Indian immigrants eagerly searching for a better life within the British Isles. Economic conditions in their homelands had become worse during the war, forcing many to return to England seeking work or extended military service. Clip for you. More than 400 heavy Jamaicans may be able to seek work in Britain and are ready and willing to do any kind of job that will help the motherland along the road for prosperity. They are all full of hope for the future, so let's make them very welcome as they begin their new life over here. Now, needless to say, this discourse changed shortly after that. In fact, there's a great newsreel piece I would love to have time to show you all called Our Jamaican Problem, that after immigration began to pick up and the whole discourse fell away of, let's welcome them here with, with our enthusiasm, suddenly then it became like, well, gee, there's too many of them. Shouldn't they kind of stay in the islands? Shouldn't they take care of their own home country? Because many people are indeed coming to England, thereby leaving Jamaica, the Windward Islands, and other places in the Caribbean in disrepair, and the economic conditions there began to worsen. So that became the overall argument for why these folks shouldn't come. Despite their previous involvement in conflict, Caribbean immigrants met resistance from some white Britons and factions of the conservative post-war government. There were concerns over potential crime, strained resources, disease, and sexual miscegenation. There were also Britons steeped in the post-war Keep Britain White campaigns, influenced by Oswald Mosley and later Eunuch Powell. And for some of you folks who may not recognize those names, Oswald Mosley was, oh man, a staunch, staunch racist who had real issues with blacks coming to England and started what he called the KBW campaign or Keep Britain White. Eunuch Powell came along in the mid to late 60s. He was a member of the House of Parliament and gave what was called the Rivers of Blood speech. Anyone heard of that before? This was a guy who addressed Parliament saying that if we allow more and more immigrants to come to the British Isles, pretty soon we'll have rivers of blood running down the streets because of the fighting that will take place. His so whole argument being that we have mistreated blacks so badly that when given power, they'll do the same to us. And it became a real rallying cry for lots and lots of people. As a means of exploring these tensions, the BBC, exploring these tensions, excuse me, the BBC began to offer programming that attempted to address the misconceptions of scientific differences of race. <clears throat> 
However, despite efforts by the service to address social problems supposedly brought about by immigration, many white Britons, according to audience surveys conducted by the BBC, were far more concerned with the social ramifications of the West Indian presence, not scientific origins. As immigration slowly increased, BBC television offered programming such as docudramas Special Inquiry, Has Britain a Color Bar, which came out in 1955, and Man from the Sun from 1956, programs that explored yet reinforced problems faced by West Indians when coming to England, underscoring cultural differences. Now, here's the important aspect about these sorts of programs, everyone. They looked a lot more at what was wrong with the idea of integration, not what was positive about it. Now take notice of how perplexing this experience seems for the West Indian immigrant. Not very encouraging, is it? You know? Okay. In conjunction, the Going to Britain booklet reaffirmed these alleged expectations for those making the perilous journey to England, including bad weather, potential diseases, and economic hardships. These forms of allegorical narratives emphasized what seemed to be the problematic West Indian presence and reaffirmed a cultural authority long established by the BBC. Along with other pieces of information on the expected difficulties featured within, going to Britain, going, featured within the Going to Britain booklet are Sir Grant Rantley Adams, Prime Minister of the West Indies. The forward notes that the publication does not set out to dissuade or persuade you they merely try and give you the facts about the difficulties you will encounter in the United Kingdom, a clearly negative subtext. He then writes that, your decision to migrate will not affect you alone, but many others. There must be a clear purpose. In other words, we hope that after you've read this booklet, you will not casually travel to England as so many others have done in the past. He addresses economic matters and reminds the reader that migration will affect family members left behind, thereby establishing concerns over fracturing the domestic family unit. Further, Garnet H. Gordon, Commissioner for the West Indies, mentions that advice within the book comes from West Indians who've already made the struggle for adaptation. Nowhere in the introduction does it mention any aspects of permanent settlement. Behind me, folks, I've put up the kind of, hope you guys can read a little bit. This is kind of the forward, forward basically, in the contents of the book itself. You can see things on shopping, landlords and landladies, for example, is up here, heating and cooking. All the kinds of things you should know about National Health Service, dentists, and things along those lines. Again, each one, dare I say, had a somewhat negative subtext, making everything seem incredibly challenging for the person coming over, attempting, of course, to live in England. The next section, called The Journey, offers the perspectives of West Indians that have traveled to England previously and provides an insider's view of the experience. Written by Ian Burke, advisor to the Commissioner for the West Indies, the narration asks the reader a host of questions regarding their intentions. In attempting to offer realistic advice upon the labor conditions in England, Burke reaffirms a frightening premise of economic and social failure. He noted, Are you thinking of coming to England? 
Are you quite sure why you're coming up? Is it to study, to earn, or to gain general experience? I've been told that many people who come to work and to study have been very disappointed. Bear in mind that jobs are getting scarcer and scarcer. People who have been here for eight months have not worked yet. Real positive reinforcement there, right? Okay. A section on living accommodations, also written by Burke, briefly reminds the reader of a climate potentially unpleasant for unsuspecting settlers. Statements suggest that England is a cold country with traditions different from those in the West Indies, are followed by advice on preparing for sleet, snow, and icy winds. Burke further places the obligation to maintain good health upon the settler, noting that authorities have shown major concerns over flu, pneumonia, and bronchitis. Listed are prices for women's and men's winter coats, gloves, sweaters, vests, and scarves, which according to the author will shock the reader. Another example of content, essays written by West Indian authors Lamming and Selvin address renting from white Britons. On a related section, remember the rules of the house, the reader is told that some landlords will welcome colored people while many others will turn them away. First of the many instances, they remind West Indians that they should prepare for and possibly tolerate racism as part of the transition. Under the header, You Are the Stranger, Lamming writes, Your greater problem will be getting on with your white neighbors. Whenever you are inclined to get angry and fly off the handle at some remark, remember the English people are ignorant to your ways and habits and may just be displaying a natural curiosity. Politeness, writes Salvin, is essential in conjunction with a section entitled Keep Smiling. It notes that certain expressions like I work like a black or a nigger in the woodpile are accepted expressions in England are not meant to be insulting, so do not be oversensitive or take offense. There will be workers who do not like West Indians and may well make nasty remarks. The best thing you can do is to ignore them or show our good sense of humor, which we boast of possessing. Oh, yeah. Within this advice, there are obvious constructs of cultural essentialism as the West Indian reader should have the good sense of humor West Indians have. The publication reminds the reader not to take offense reinforcing a post-colonialized yet othered status of the immigrant reader. Another major concern addressed within the booklet is employment. Here, David Muirhead, chief community officer, discusses the great difficulty one has when attempting to learn a trade through apprenticeships. Family ties are essential in that one can only become an apprentice if your father or uncle or some other close relative is a craftsman, making it nearly impossible for first-generation immigrants to attain these positions. Even with skills such as carpentry or ship fitting gained during the war, the text reminds West Indians of redundancy. If Englishmen find it hard to become skilled men, you can imagine how, how jealous they are. You can see that they resent the admission of West Indians into their skilled group, Mira writes, and addresses the reality of racism from supervisors. <coughs> Excuse me. In the section Prejudice Against the Foreigner, Muirhead writes, one employer noted, I have a small firm. It's important to me that all my employees get on together. If I take in a colored man, it's possible some of my people might not like it. I just don't want to take the risk, especially if I can find other suitable people quite easily. Once the immigrant accepts these realities, another important issue is getting along with workmates. The writer notes how many English workers engage in discussions about football. Therefore, in order to fit with your workmates, the immigrant should become a supporter of the home team, so at least you will be one of the boys. However, when considering the previous advice that underscores issues of race and belonging, this association seems quite remote. In a related effort by the BBC, Director General Hugh Green and members of management held a conference with West Indian representatives on 13 July 1965 at Broadcasting House in England. The focus of the meeting seemed quite encouraging in that Green reaffirmed the BBC's public service onus and the organization's duty to assist immigrants any way that they could. Now, just for a moment, this is a part of a memo, many, one of many, many memos I've dug up over the years, that basically talks about this meeting they're going to have with West Indians at Broadcasting House. Well, the thing is, this took place on 13 July 65. One week before that, they had a separate meeting with Indians and Pakistanis. I could just blow your mind right now with how different these meetings were. 
in that with the Indians and Pakistanis, they were far more welcomed, and there was no going to Britain booklet there for them. However, there was a going to Britain booklet there for Indians, for West Indians, excuse me, coming in to the country. When asked, the West Indian participants felt that the conference was indeed helpful, but representatives were still concerned that BBC programs should lean toward integration rather than emphasizing racial differences. The suggestion was that the organization should take into account that white and colored people are living in mixed communities and would be listening to and watching these programs together. However, the participants in the West Indian community were reminded that there are differences which masses of people were not capable of accepting. Further, copies of Going to Britain were brought to the meeting for distribution. A brief note written to conference organizers indicated that copies would be available near the door and would hopefully be viewed as a proactive measure or an example of something being done before or anti-integration as opposed to what might be post-migration. You can see here, thank you for your note about the 1,300 copies still in stock. We passed some out previously in Jamaica before the immigration bill becomes law, you know, a proactive measure to stop them from coming in. Then other information, too, about the Commonwealth Act, which I mentioned in 1962, which was forthcoming. Beyond that, this was sent out also, too, to various members at the meeting, that is, members of the BBC management. Copies near the door, again, anti-migration, which means pre-migration, as opposed to post migration. And again, this last sentence is very, very interesting. I thought it might be best to keep the lids on the sideline, okay, for the first conference at any rate, since the pamphlet is for West Indians. Again, the first conference with Pakistanis and Indians, no such pamphlet, just for West Indians. Anthony Martin, program organizer for Colonial and Caribbean Services, also felt to, of course, keep us on the sidelines for the first conference since the pamphlet is for West Indians. A reminder of how these booklets were provided to West Indians at their BBC conference, but not to Indians or Pakistanis who met with Green and BBC management the week prior. As aspects of British post-colonialism post often controlled the political, economic, and cultural structure of many Caribbean nations, guidance offered within going to Britain representing British authority and paternalism reinforced through subsequent social practice. While notions of cultural ambivalence are present, binary constructs of cultural differences repress cultural hybridity until specific immigrant groups earn what John Fisk calls honorary whiteness, a space often shared with Asians, but seldom with blacks or West Indians. And this goes into a body of work too from John Fisk, my advisor in my grad program, in which he talked about how often Asians, even in this country, especially in this country, were often seen as kind of honorary whites in that they were far more socially acceptable. Kind of goes back to Rudyard Kipling's notions, too, about um, or just the whole hierarchy of nations. And we can go back to de Gobineau and Kant and Heigl as well, in which whites were at the top, supposedly, according to scientific minds of the 17th century, with Asians uh, a somewhat distant second, Latinos a much further third, and blacks at the very, very bottom the faces at the bottom of the well, as Derek Bell talks about. Despite the changing racial and social makeup of England and shifts in constitutive power toward transculturalism, going to Britain reinforced the mythic operation of the BBC's autonomy and importance. The choice of prized West Indian authors as narrators situated within colonial patronage again reinforces the strategy of white British discursive authority to know what's best, by example, no less. The booklet provided a site in which cultural imperialism and mass media operate in conjunction, creating comparative implications. Also notable is the Going to Britain cover. Featured is a black woman standing on a train platform looking toward the ground in a manner that is clearly melancholy. She wears a dense winter coat and stands before a mound of heavy luggage, an image that immediately reinforces the dystopic possibilities of living in England. A white man and woman who seem to be staring at her as an outsider steeped within social incursion seem to amplify her displacement. Further, she has not yet left the station, seemingly dumbfounded by her new circumstances, unable to decide what to do next. And again, one picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, we can see here the look on her face and these folks in the background like, who is she? 
And what is she doing in my town? One is reminded of the analysis of the Paris match cover by Roland Barthes featuring a young Negro in French uniform saluting with his eyes uplifted, possibly toward the French flag. Bart notes that the signification of France as a great empire in which all her sons faithfully serve under her flag leads to the notion that colonialism and bigotry are non-existent, demonstrated by this young man serving his so-called oppressors, as Bart would say. The cover of Going to Britain provides a far more insidious image featuring a West Indian woman near disembarkation point with what appears to be deep regret. The semiological system includes her as a signified notion of cultural incompatibility, looking saddened and uncomfortable, woefully maladapted to these new surroundings. This is clearly not the best image to use for a travel brochure. And again, she doesn't look happy at all, as you all can see. That's what she gets for coming to Britain, though, right? At least that's so the publication would tell us. Issues related to immigration have for eons underscored the othering of immigrant cultures by imagined communities. Communities awkwardly stitched together through nationalism and ethnic purity. Within our current age of DACA, Brexit, and a $70 million border wall, a border riddled with literally an unknown number of tunnels, inclusion of the immigrant other, particularly those of a different ethnicity, remains problematic. Historically, BBC's Going to Britain booklet attempts to reinforce cultural normality, creating conformity and promote assimilation into a mythical British way of life. It also reinforced post-colonial and potentially neo-colonial discourses, further subjugating these hopeful citizens. While West Indian settlers expressed a desire to be considered British first and black secondarily within radio talks and discussions, the booklet reminded them of the inescapable consequences of immigration and subsequent xenophobia if they were indeed going to Britain. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Questions, comments, please. Hope it made sense. Go, Mel. Mm -hmm. or even Fox News, you know, doing something like this. Right. Um, was this a real exception in sort of what would be thought of as the portfolio of the BBC? Was it a kind of an aberration in their historical mission? Not at all. Know that the BBC, unlike, of course, American broadcasters like CNN and Fox, is, of course, non-commercial. So there's no pressure from sponsorship or pressure from corporate entities trying to determine what the programming should say. The BBC instead felt as though they had this sort of cultural onus to make certain they addressed every possible issue that they could. So therefore, being non-commercial, they accepted licensing fees from people around the country. And just like, for example, we may pay our taxes here. People there pay taxes to keep the BBC on the air. Well, along with that, the BBC then has to apply a kind of mandate every year to remind people what they're going to do and that means addressing every possible issue they could. Again, the problem, though, is they weren't prepared for this taking place within their own country. They talked a lot about racism in America, big time. In fact, one of the best broadcasts I ever heard, because there's audio, was from 1954, which they brought over an American pastor to talk about race in America named Martin Luther King. Okay? And they jumped all over South Africa. They jumped all over West Africa, but they never talked about racism in England until this. Then they were forced to by that very same mandate. You're right, I can't imagine Fox News or CNN doing that if they had the choice, you know? So, yeah. Other questions or comments, please? Yes, Margaret. Are these Yes, through licensing fees. That includes BBC and non BBC 2, 3, and 4 which are digital channels. Yeah, and BBC One, of course, is sort of like the mainstay. BBC Two became the kind of alternate programming, the more cutting edge stuff, and three and four became much more specialized for their markets, but they're all funded by licensing fees. And every year, they really do have to go out of their way to convince the British public that they do deserve to have the licensing fees again, because if they can't make their case, then they become a secondary broadcaster, and like Granada steps up or 
Channel 4 or ITV or someone like that. And Channel 4 and ITV are commercially driven, unlike the Beeb. So it changes everything as well. In fact, the Director General, the original one for the BBC, uh, Sir John Reith, hated commercial television and thought that commercial television was the worst thing that ever happened in England because it allowed sponsors to have much more power. And of course, we saw that here in this country, didn't we? In the 1950s, you think about things like, and that's for us old guys, but things like uh, the Kraft Music Hall, okay? And, um, oh my goodness, uh, USS Steel Hour on CBS. All these sorts of programs sponsored by just one particular company that then could step in and say, well, wait a second, we don't like that actor. We're paying for the commercial for the entire season. We don't like that person, get rid of them. Or can't you guys change that a bit? Like I remember the classic um, case of Rod Serling having written a screenplay for NBC for a show called Patterns about um, an older man working in the advertising game in New York in Manhattan who was going to be forced out by a younger guy coming in. And there's a classic scene which he's talking to his boss, almost pleading for his job. And there's a big picture window in the background. It's all just a set, of course. But outside the window is the Chrysler building. Okay, the sponsor for the show was Ford Motor. They said, uh-uh. And they made them stop the day of filming. Because it was actually not even filming, it was a live broadcast. They made them stop the very day of broadcast and change the entire scene. to not feature the Chrysler building. That would never happen with the Beeb. But the BBC had his own demons to deal with as well, as I indicated here a moment ago. So, Karen? So can you follow up on one of those questions? Please. I was like, you know, these interesting eras with mm. that short time frame. Welcome to Happy Movie, the voice of a British accent, mm -hmm. to, huh, this is a little harder to, maybe you shouldn't come. Mm -hmm. You're saying that is, is it a combination of the conflict happening in the country as well as sponsors who have an agenda? Is it a kind of an amalgam of well, that are part of the shift? kind of. Well, again, there were no sponsors because the BBC wasn't commercially driven. Okay. It was paid for by licensing fees. And again, Sir John Reith made it clear when he started as director general of BBC, we will not have that kind of pressure on us. We'll make our own decisions. Now, the person putting pressure on them was House of Parliament. If Parliament swung conservative, they would then tell the BBC, hey, wait a second, we got too many of those brown guys coming in the country. Can't you guys do something about it? The BBC fought back against this, but ultimately they kind of got their way causing Sir John Reith to step down in 1958 and just quit his job because he felt as though the government had too much influence. So there was that issue, yeah. Otherwise, it kind of changed as a result of Parliament. It changed as a result of certain issues taking place around the country. Um, racial riots like Notting Hill and also Nottingham. And despite the fact those were caused by teddy boys, that is blue collar white guys, working class, coming into neighborhoods picking fights and, and causing certain sorts of skirmishes, uh, black West Indians fought back in certain cases. Then the cops had to come in, the things got really messy. So all these folks who were just starting to regroup psychologically from this thing called World War II were like saying, you guys enough with the drama. Make things right. That means those people leaving, let them go. If it means them staying here and settling in, Fine, but make a decision. And the BBC said, gee, okay, let us, let, let's help. Hence the programming. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So is there any information out there about how these were received by the audience in the West Indies? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sorry, wait. Uh, it's okay. Did people believe it, not believe it? Did it have an impact? This guy named Daryl Newton wrote a book about it. <laughs> and if you get the book, no. Yeah, um... Back in the, okay, let me, let me back up a minute. Let's talk about the West Indies specifically. The West Indies received British broadcasts by way of shortwave radio, okay? And what they were receiving during the war was programs like I showed you guys called um, Caribbean Voices, in which authors would get on air and read their work. They'd read letters back home to people. Soldiers and sailors would read back home to folks. And remember, you guys, the armed forces in the UK were integrated long before our armed forces were here. They'd read back over the air um, to folks back home, and they'd be listening, all crowd around shortwave radio. So when it, when it served England to bring out the best of racial issues within the armed forces to recruit more soldiers of color, they did so. It was after the war that the problems began, you know, 
Then suddenly we start hearing broadcasts saying, well, if you're going to England, you better be careful. This may happen. This may happen. And of course, the booklet came out just after that. Didn't stop people. They still came because by that time, many women and their children had husbands and fathers already in England who are now sending for them. And that really freaked out the British government because now you had the possibility of procreation. When men were there on their own, no problem. But stay away from the white girls, though, which became a big issue as well with the BBC. Then ultimately, when families came over, then we may have more kids, and all of a sudden, England may get browner and browner and blacker and blacker, and it became a major problem as far as they were concerned. But again, despite the fact things like this came out, and booklets were published, and a couple of TV shows made England seem very dystopic, it didn't stop folks from coming, nevertheless. So, yeah. Yes, sir. So, just uh, let me clarify on one thing with uh, uh, the West Indies. The only country that was mentioned was Jamaica, and I'm wondering if a lot of this was towards Jamaicans, or was it were all West were all West Indians seeing the same from the BBC? Yes, they were. Because not everybody in the West Indies sees everybody else the same. Not at all. Jamaica has a reputation, and that's why I'm asking. Oh, the BBC lumped the Caribbean together. Again, that cultural essentialism I talked about before in which if you are indeed a West Indian, you're likely to be this. And ironically, as Mary was asking about before, there's a, a film clip that I showed when I gave a presentation about the second book uh, several weeks back, in which the BBC put together a small newsreel shown in theaters that begins showing a room of different sorts of races all together in military uniforms. And the first thing you hear from the narrator is, these are West Indians, every single one indicating that West Indians weren't all black, some were white, some were Asian, et cetera, et cetera. So when it served their purposes to kind of deconstruct that notion of what West Indians were supposed to be, they surely did so. However, by this time, they were all lumped together as black people coming over at a time they really shouldn't be. And they talked about Jamaica, the Windward Islands, oh man, Trinidad, Tobago, all of them. Any colonies that fell under the Brits they didn't de address in that fashion. At the same time, however, you know who's getting all the jobs as immigrants coming into the country at that time were Germans and Poles, who were indeed England's enemies during World War II. There's a big pushback on that issue as well. You know? And I've never in my life, in my research, you guys found more anti-Semitism from Brits than during this time, which is a very different issue. Yeah, they had issues with that. They were accepting Germans and Poles to work in the factories alongside uh, guys who had just fought against them like four or five years prior, but not black West Indians and not Jews. They weren't too crazy about Irish either, as you guys may know. What's the sign? No Irish, no dogs, no Irish, no coloreds. Not necessarily in that order. Yeah. So. Other questions, please, you guys, or comments? Yes, ma'am. So how have things evolved? I mean, mm. that's a long <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So, did things get any better? Are they still a range of problems, just different problems? Mm -hmm. Margaret, I think it totally depends on who you are as a person of color coming into England. When I first started going over to England in 1992 to start doing some research to get myself into grad school at Madison, I had the opportunity to go to a cocktail party with some friends. And this is mainly people of color who work for the BBC. And they all talked about whether they considered themselves to be black British or Afro-Caribbean. Okay, very, very different ways of looking at their place in England. And some argued that they didn't like it there. They wanted to go home to the island. Some say, hey, this is my home. My parents have spilled blood for this country. I intend to stay here. I think those individuals, however, who come from the States are accepted very differently. When I came over, I had no problems whatsoever. But then again, they realized I was there just temporarily. I wasn't trying to move there and take a job. Mm -hmm. If I'd come in, perhaps speaking some Jamaican patois, it may have been very, very different, you know? At this point, what I've noticed, and we're talking now about, and I think I've been there, last time I checked my passports, I've been there 32 times since 92, giving papers and doing research. These days, that's not quite a concern anymore. It's much more about class consideration. In fact, in many ways, it always has been. It's always been about socioeconomic status, or SES. So, for example, if I walk into a restaurant, let's say with, uh, with Mary, 
okay, as, as a white British woman. We walk in, we get seated at a table, we're treated famously, not a problem. If I walk in, let's say, with a black British woman, and she says, hey, waiter, we want a bloody table right now, they're going to say, what's he doing with her? Because there's a class difference. So it's much more about that. And classism isn't any better than racism, but it's a little bit, difficult, a little bit easier to navigate sometimes. Yeah, so there's a lot more of that. And the problem was when black West Indians came over after the Second World War, they were assumed to be of a lower SES, and they were of a lower class status. So they were assumed to not be polished, not be educated, not be skilled, so they didn't want them in the country. You know? Yet they welcomed King, they welcomed Malcolm X, they welcomed Sophie Carmichael and other black Americans, including me. So. Great comments and questions, folks. Any others, please? Yes, ma'am. I'm so fascinated by this sort of hidden but direct message in the going to Britain. Mm -hmm. you know, please come, but you're going to be miserable. You know, all, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now when we look at what's being stated in our press from some of our leaders and also have things throughout Europe, the message is direct and cruel. And mm -hmm. How do you make sense of wow, that transition Mm. Um, and I'm not saying the message should be polite and equally racist, mm -hmm. but it's just astonishing to see, and maybe it's the 50s thing, <laughs> I don't know, where directness wasn't necessarily the focus, but I'm just curious how you're thinking about what you're listening to in the news now, mm -hmm. and whether in some ways it's still the same old message that's always been delivered, but just more harshly, or how do you interpret that? I think it's all about sheer numbers. See, back then, on the Empire Windrush, there were only 492 West Indian men, and there were like three female stowaways. By, that was 1948. By about 1955, there were about maybe 8,000 that came over. By 1958, 12,000. You see, so it wasn't like in mass. There was like just increasing amounts. But by the 1960s, that was up to maybe like 30 or 40,000 in a country of well over 4.5 million people. And people still were freaked by the idea that the numbers were increasing. So we think about today's standards, my goodness. You have a lot, a lot of folks immigrating into the country. But then again, the Brits aren't quite so concerned about the West Indians anymore. They have other troubles with Brexit. So, Yes? Independence for Jamaica was 1962? Something like that. Yeah, under Manly, did, did yeah. The, did the role yeah. of independence have an impact either from Jamaicans going to a broad prior or post, or did it also have a role with Britain going Maybe we can address this issue by accelerating or moving towards independence with, uh, from these countries. The Brits moved toward independence as a way of encouraging many West Indians to go back home. Mm -hmm. you got your own country now, and they need you down there to help build it. You need to work those fields. You need to go back and do architectural drafting and all sorts of other efforts in your country. It was argued that was one of the primary reasons they got their independence. Mm -hmm. That and beside the fact that there were people like Bustamante we had real issues, of course, with the Brits being there. But it was a good way to draw some people away. It didn't work. The folks who were in England were there to stay. They weren't going anywhere, you know. Even at the party, when I talked with my friends, the ones who were so fiercely nationalistic about the, Briti about the, um, the West Indies, they were very, very invested in that country, and they weren't going to leave until they were much, much older. So it wasn't like they were going to pack up and leave. And most of the West Indians I've come to know there who are now second, third generation, are very much black British as far as they're concerned. So, yeah, yeah. Anything else, folks? Questions, concerns, comments? How are we doing for time? We're about there, aren't we? Okay, all right, you guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you.